Eight years ago at the time, I was male, 27, a seven-year veteran at a large tech corporation, senior designer on a communications team. By then, the senior copywriter went out on mat leave, leaving a temp in her place. Well, they're irritating in a non-descriptive way she presented well and seemed competent enough for later context. She was also an uber dog lover and a staunch and righteous vegan CWW. There were frequent mutual and innocent team pranks, things like replacing a box of diet cookies with a box of crispy creams or covering the laser on someone's mouth like old dog. You got me kind of thing. Now let me fix that and let you get back to work. Being desperate for acceptance, new temps started taking things a bit far and seemed to focus pranks directly towards me. Even after a few subtle reference for our manager, she continued things like slipping inappropriate photos or comments into a PowerPoint presentation on the share drive. I was about to give or fake crying during morning stand-up just to gauge reactions. Her novelty wore off fast-fast, forward to the morning after my birthday. She knew I was going to be hungover. I get to my desk, red-eyed and thirsty as hell, grab my water bottle at my desk, which I always get full, and started chugging it like it's going to save my life. It was straight vodka, at least two full swallows before I realised I go straight from my garbage bin to throw up the slurry of alphabet soup and at least six cans of beer and God knows what else she put in there, made damn sure I did her. I got most of the vodka out, already being hungover. It made me instantly drunk again, was not impressed. She came in laughs and her brains out taking full claim. I didn't knock on her, but the story made the rounds to HR and she was given a stern warning, or if accepting an apology, even remorse, but not a shred. In fact, she started calling me a pukey McGee, literally no one's fanfare. I let it pass for a few weeks, waiting for the attention to die down. Revenge, they finally arrived. She always left at 10am to get a Starbucks. I took this time to plaster a lost dog posters anywhere outside the office. She might stumble by on her way back. She fell for the bait asking around, but no one was the wiser when she was cosy at a desk. I went to her car to stage a hit-and-run massacre with chunks of fatty steak, a litre of fake blood and an old leash and collar and a bag of fake fur. I went to work, I'd share the pick, but it's long gone, but it was very convincing. Looked like a leash was caught around her rear passenger axle and the dog got clogged in shredded between the tyre wheel and, well, I left the collar dangling out at the back with a particularly generous portion of gore and a puddle of blood. It didn't take long before others noticed the lost dog posters or the gory car and put two and two together. Eventually, the owner of the white so-and-so with licence plate such and such, please come to reception, when over the intercom is on, it was delicious. She was out in the lot sobbing so hard she was coughing carefully, placing chunks of bloody furry gore into a box. It took her an hour to gather every precious bit crying the entire time. My theory was that she wanted to return the dog to its owner as best she could before calling. The number on the poster was a shame there was no owner or dog, but she was too distraught to realise it was fake. I thought for sure the lack of bones or guts and obviously fake sticky stage blood were being their instant giveaway, but to my utter shock it wasn't a scenario I wasn't expecting. And welcome just the same, it was just assumed the dog owner had printed the wrong number on the poster because the remains never were returned. She had the collar and leash clean and posters of her own put in hopes of finding the owner, given her reputation. There wasn't much sympathy offered. The righteous vegan dog lover was now a dog killer and took every chance I could to remind her of that. She took down all the gaudy dog lover crap off her desk and kept very much to herself for the remainder of her term bonus that she even left early, but not sure if I can take credit for that, for certain disclaimer for those that will likely claim she liked me and wanted my attention. I assure you that was not the case. There was more background than just this story, even if it were this an adulthood, not a grade school. And I thought I should clear a few things up. Based on the comments, Opie is not a vegan, however. As a huge animal lover owned several dogs' cats and rescued many animals, and wild and domestic. 
Opie has nothing against vegans, just the ones that preach it. Relevant distinction for our personality. In a subsequent reaction, not the reason for a revenge, Three steak bits were easy way of describing a bag of butcher scraps at the time. To make it clear the ones that thought was petty revenge for minor inconveniences here is a list. Of some more inconvenient pranks, replacing water with vodka was just the last straw, and it's tantamount to poisoning illegal and quite possibly fatal medication alone could seal that deal quite quickly. Hiding car keys and leaving wasted hours of people's lives but was welcomed lose to cab companies pulling fuses from cars. As dangerous again could be fatal, brake lights, headlights, airbags. All very important. You should think right. Release entire pressure. Does your office have an air compressor on hand? Lacing other presentations with profanity and photos could be career-ending. Not going to have to check every file before sending or presenting number one in hindsight. I do regret not coming clean. The believability was not expected and I froze. But the practice most definitely stopped when bullies don't get the point from a passive and apathetic authority. The only route is to pop them straight in the nose, good and hard to, again. To those thinking it was to nuclear, why are you on the sub anyways? There's fight subs. I'm sure need your wisdom about non-violence number three. After this blew up, I reached out to a mutual friend that also worked there. He said she almost definitely did catch on, for which I'm glad C5 cleaned up Call a Postal was a return salvo. And to garner sympathy, as mentioned, no bones, no guts, and the fabric backing with printed barcodes, she'd been a giveaway to even marginal intelligence. And she wasn't intellectually stupid by any means. I got to say, I have some sympathy straight vodka on a hangover. I would be pissed off. I'd be so angry if someone did that to me. And then having to puke up in front of your work, mum. Dodgy as hell. But what do you think about that revenge? Let me know if the revenge was just the right amount or he went too far. I'd love to know your opinions. Below I'm Next Door is from Thrown Away Bit Twin. I didn't give my brother my kidney because he had an affair with my girlfriend, then outed me as bisexual. I was told to post my story here and figured this was my revenge cast, fake names for obvious reasons. Me Ryan brother Sebastian mum, mum, dad, dad sister Jane, best friend Isaac, Cousin Kai, backstabbing cow girlfriend, husband Daniel, I Ryan, and my twin brother Sebastian have never ever been close. In fact, he made life hell growing up. My parents didn't help by playing favourites, getting him better stuff on our birthday, only going to see films he liked at the cinema, and giving him extra money for housework. Despite us doing the same amount of work, he would always put me down, belittle me, bully me with his friends at school, break my stuff and then blame me. And was just a pain in general growing up. The only people I knew to rely on was my older sister Jane, my cousin Kai and best friend Isaac, who all knew what an awful person my brother was. Anyway, cut to when I was 17 and I had my first girlfriend, someone I loved very much. We didn't have sex because she wanted the way to wear 18th birthday to lose her virginity. And it turns out she was having an affair with my brother behind my back for half the time we're together and only got caught when it was revealed she was pregnant. I was crushed. She knew how much I hated my brother and she saw some of the awful things he did to me, but she still went ahead and did that. Cheating is bad enough, but to do it with him of all people, I punched him in the face and broke his nose and made him lose a tooth. But according to my parents, I'm the one in their wrong. And then we have to have this girl who's caring my brother's child and have to help support them. My brother then said he had no intention of being a father and told my girlfriend to get an abortion. She never ran out of town. I never saw her again. Don't know she had the baby or aborted. All I know is she was gone. And my folks were still praising my brother as the golden child. I was still the black sheep and failure as usual. Another year goes past and me and my brother still despise each other. But I started dating again it was a long while but I found someone found a boy I liked. I'm bisexual, and this new guy Daniel I had met at college caught my eye. He was deaf, and I studied sign language out of boredom. 
So we got talking and things just seemed to click. We date, fall in love, bring into my friend Isaac's party to introduce him to my friends. And it all feels great at this point. Anyone who knew I was bi was Isaac. But one day, walking into the cinema holding my boyfriend's hand, I went in my evil twin. He points laughs and says some homophobic remarks I can't give himself. And I go to see a movie with my arm around my boyfriend when I got home after dropping my boyfriend home. I knew I'd be facing something as I walked through the front door. I saw both my parents on the sofa, my mother crying about how on earth she could have given birth to someone so disgusting. Was it too much to hope she saw the lights and was talking about my brother, but no, she was talking about me and how am I staying on the family's name? My father gets up to yell at me about homophobic remarks and slurs. At this point, I see my brother at the staircase with a shit-eating grin on his face. He then comes down and says he's uncomfortable sharing a room with a homophobic slur. And my folks kicked me out there. And then, with what little clothes and money I had, I went to Isaac's house. His family took me in where I stayed for six months, actually, experiencing family love and affection. And Isaac's mother and stepdad, I consider my own parents. Now, eventually me, Daniel and Isaac all get a two-bedroom flat together and all is good for the time being. So cut to December last year, me and my boyfriend and now husband Daniel were married. Isaac was my best man. My sister and cousin Kai walked me down the aisle. I have a brilliant job in graphic design, never in-house by the sea, and life has never been better. However, I got a call from my sister that my brother was in hospital and thought about in that much over the nine-year period since I was kicked out. But being reminded his existence brought up four painful memories for me. I was told by my sister that Sebastian wanted to see me and they... it was urgent. So I went to the hospital. He was in my sister outside the front entrance, asked her what this is about, and she doesn't tell me, and I need to ask my twin. So I rise to where my brother is, who had my parents set aside. My folks actually look happy to see me, as if what they did to me hadn't happened. And Sebastian also looked really pleased to see me. It's safe to say something was off, eventually asked what's going on. And while I was even here, to which my brother tears my family to leave us, to alone, he looked so weak, as before he used to intimidate me so much, he told me he was died from kidney failure and has been for the past few years, and now he didn't have long left. I knew immediately where this was going. He then said he always regretted that we never got along, at which point I told him no, he looked confused, and that's what I was on about, so I simply told him I wasn't going to donate my kidney to save him. He looked as if I just, in his food, he didn't want to, about how bad the situation was, and it was really sorry for all the things we did to each other growing up. Like, excuse me, we did to each other. I'm talking that I wanted a brother growing up that cared and loved me and who wouldn't try to break me every day for 18 years. He then called in our mum and dad who called not willing to give up my kidney and they started to spout off I owed them for my existence and I have a duty to look after family. Ask them where was that duty when they kicked me out of the house or where they was every time my brother gave me a black eye. All their duty was to look after their grandchild when Sebastian decided he didn't want to be a father. I said for all the things he'd done from out to me, Kevin affair with my girlfriend and abandoned his child, this was the universe's. And my, we're finally given back what he dished out to bite him in the arse. I then turned around and walked out the room. Having that been the last time I ever saw Sebastian again, not sure why they want homophobic slurs, kidney, and way I won't pass my sister who gave me a look, I gave her a look back who didn't turn. They gave me a look and said, I understand. After leaving a hospital, I felt as it's a great weight been taken off my shoulders. I went home. I never looked back. Please with my decision, no. Last week, I get a call from my sister calling to inform you that Sebastian had died. She asked if I was OK. And I said I was. I didn't really feel anything. In all honesty, she said she understood to a degree as Sebastian hadn't been all that kind to her over the years either. And my husband and I, Zach, there to support me. Honestly, at this point, Isaac may as well have been our adopted child since he's living with us. This whole situation with the world is over. 
The next day, I was getting calls and texts from family members I had spoke to in years, telling me that I'm going to hell for being a bad son, being a bad brother, and for being a homophobic slur, and that me and my husband don't deserve children hubby. And I have been looking into adoption and surrogacy. This makes me second-guess my choice, have not given my brother my kidney. Even in death is making things harder for me. I did wonder if I was a bad person and if I made the wrong decision, but I knew if I was in that position, I would have been left for dead. Screw him. Other bits of information that made clear things up. Number one, his renal failure was from living hardcore lifestyle of drugs and alcohol to my folks and sister did. Get themselves tested to see if they were matches and none of them were three. I just owned them for being my family years ago apart from Jane. So when I got married, I took my husband's last name and it was Isaac's last name, which his folks were very pleased about for some family Kai's folks and my dad's brother have actually called to see how I was doing and so they don't judge me for what happened. Others, however, have continued with said abuse, whom I have now blocked five. If he had been a good brother throughout life, I'd have done it without second thought. I'd have done the same for Jane Kai Isaac and my husband, but I felt he didn't deserve it, six. It's likely I'll never see my parents again, and I'll make sure my children would never meet them. My revenge. To them will be being a better parent than they ever were. I got to say... I can see where this guy's coming from. His life was hell growing up by his brother, who actually called him out on all sorts of stuff, like proper deep stuff, like the guy coming out and told his parents and was laughing about it. That stuff is just not cool, so I can totally see where this guy's coming from. Not one donate a kidney, an organ, to someone who's a piece of, you know, blood is just blood, but family is family, you know? And I wouldn't consider those people family at all. They're absolute ourselves, narcissists and horrible people. But what do you guys make that story? Was the revenge too much or was it just the right amounts? Let me know in the comments below. And our next story is from a vicious tradition. Excuse me, Satan. I think you're in my seat. We're going to start off this story by saying that this is absolutely not one of my most shining moral moments. Not I'm well aware. It's a straight up for doing what I did. My only real defence is I was in a super bad place mentally and needed in mountains worth of therapy if you're curious about the circumstances. About her check, my profile was evil in human form. Now on with the revenge, I was a weird kid growing up. Really weird it was mostly I was being abused at home and forcibly isolated. My social skills were so undeveloped, had difficulty reading human faces – Aside from my grandmother, grandfather and father being the weird kid meant I was duty target for bullies. It never stopped. But there was one bully that I hated more than the others we call her Holly. This girl never passed up an opportunity to make my life hell. And since she lives across the street from me, there was nowhere I could avoid her. Holly treated me like garbage. Here are a few examples. She put dog crap in our mailbox on a regular basis. She left my dog out my yard and I was never able to get her back. She also sit on my porch with her friends and roast the hell out of me to entertain them. If I so much as put a toe outside my front door, it went on for years. I hated her with a fiery passion of a thousand sons. But while my grandmother was still alive, there was nothing I could do about Holly if I did anything to walk back in anyway. My grandmother would punish me for it. I was more afraid of her than I was of Holly for a very good reason. So I made a plan. I suffered through all the abuse and promised myself that when I was older, I would make Holy pay for what she did to me. Thinking of what I was going to do to her when the time was right was sometimes the only thing that kept me going. Over time, Holly grew up and eventually left me alone and stopped being an I'm 40 for her by then. It was too late about a new, more epiphany. I'd been nursing my grudge for two decades and it was time for a reckoning I was going to destroy. That when my grandmother finally died, it was go time and I had 20 years to plan. I was an idol why I waited. I made it my mission in life to learn as much about Holly as possible. And to do it, I became friends with a few people on the periphery of her social circle. Eventually, I knew more about her and her life than her own mother did. 
The first step I took in my plan was getting her fired from her job. It took longer than I liked, but I eventually managed it. Holly worked at a doctor's office, and I knew the doctor she worked for was super Christian, a very straight edge. I've standing type of guy, he also had a huge influence on the local community, scheduling my visits to beyond, the days Holly was off work. After a couple of visits, I just happened to notice Holly in the staff photo on the waiting room wall. I made a show of looking surprising than concerned. I got to the exam room and the doctor came in shortly after the expression on my face got his attention and he asked me what was wrong. I told him even though I didn't want to, as a Christian, I couldn't keep my knowledge a secret and still sleep at night because I couldn't lay mean, dangerous soul and reputation by doing nothing and it's full of tension then I asked him as one fellow Christian to another not to tell anyone where he got the information I was about to give him after he promised I told him I knew Holly was using illegal drugs he was absolutely floored at first he didn't believe me I told me what I understood his scepticism entirely but it was easy enough to prove or disprove my information with a drug test if I was wrong he lost nothing if I was right, he was saving himself from trouble down the road. He finally agreed to test her. And he tested everyone else too, so that it didn't look like Holly was the only target. See, I wasn't actually lying. Holly smoked a shitload of weed. And I knew that because it was my dad, she used to get it from... He'd been a weed do since she was like 15. Her test came back positive for marijuana. And much to my surprise, Xanax oopsie. The Dr V Holly on the spot when the results of the urinalysis came back. And then he called me to thank me for telling me what was going on. And before he hung up, he told me that I truly walked with the Lord. Your will never know how hard I had to fight, not to laugh. And the depths of his wrongness, I thought I was going to pop a blood vessel. Phase one completes. I know what you're thinking. It's just a job. And it's not like she can't go get another one. Right, losing the job isn't the end of the world. You'd be wrong. Remember how I said our boss had a very high reputation in our area? That man called every hospital and doctor's office in the state personally to make sure that none of them would hire Hawley and risk liability and lots of community trusts for associating with her Holly's field of study was all pertaining to medical profession. So her education was rendered worthless because nobody would hire her. I wasn't done yet. Nope, not even close. She lost her job because she had no income. Her car got repossessed. She still had her family, though, two kids and a fiancé who needs families all right. With the help of a good friend of mine, we catfished the out of a fiancé. My friend is hot as. And she let me use pictures of her to prove that she was really real. She even got on Skype with him once when he finally made the arrangements for a face-to-face -face encounter and booked a hotel room. I texted the screenshot of everything to Holly from a burner number to say the extra mint impacted the oscillating unit would be a vast understatement. They broke up. The whole thing was an ordeal. And Holly was devastated. She had two kids, no job, and now no fiancé who could help her keep the family afloat. A normal person would have stopped. Then, unfortunately, I'm not normal, and I was going full scorched earth. I see for 20 years, no way in hell. I was going easy on her phase three with a fiancé gone and no job. Holly was struggling badly. She need money and she needed it quickly before she and the kids got evicted. Meth is a giant problem in my area. It's high risk, but it's also fast money. So I started subtly mentioning Holly situation among my more legally questionable family. Eventually, one of my family's friends who happened to be a meth cook got in contact with Holly and offered her a shitload of cash to let him cook dough for her house. It was supposed to be a one-time thing. Two days and then done forever. Holly was desperate, so she said yes. Everything went smoothly at first, but dead in the middle of the cook, someone caught an anonymous tip about an active cook in progress at a local narcotics unit. They rolled up on Holly's house at about 3am and caught everybody inside, including Holly. 
red-handed making meth watching her cry, when they hang after I put her in that police cruiser was one of the most glorious, satisfying moments of my life. She was in deep legal doo-doo. And to make the bad situation even worse, most houses where labs are discovered aren't deemed habitable afterwards because of their toxic fumes from the chemicals used to make the drug get everywhere now super harder and time-consuming to clean. It's up to the property owners that either hire a hazmat team to clean it or condemn it and tear it down. Allowed cleanup costs thousands of dollars, it would have cost even more money to clean it. Then the entire property was worth. So it got torn down with everything Holly owns still inside. You can't take things out of a meth lab because they're going to be covered in toxic residue. It can make you very sick, especially young children. Everything in the residence is usually counted as a loss. Now, some people sneak in and grab stuff anyway, but whatever, it's their funeral. But since Holly was still sitting in jail, there was no way for her to get anything. And then, of her close family, were interested in risking getting caught sneak into the house and being accused of stealing or tampering with a crime scene, Holly ended up in jail for a while while she was gone. The court gave their father ex-fiancé sole custody of their children and Holly was only given supervised visitation two hours every Saturday. If I recall correctly, revenge is a dish best served cold and mine was freezing. I was behind every single bad thing that happened in Holly's life in one way or another for an entire five-year period. She decided she liked bullying me and making my life hell and she figured there would never be any consequences. Instead, I took a reputation, her job, her fiancé got her arresting convicted of a felony and her children taken from her. The best part is that she had no clue I did it to this very day. She'd forgotten about me, all she did to me and impacted my life forever. But to her, it wasn't even important enough to her to bother remembering I was nothing to her. So she never connected me to her problems. Last I heard she was in rehab for alcoholism and her parental rights terminated permanently after she lost their kids. She just sort of gave up and crawled into a bottle and never came out again. I was tempted to tell her, but I decided that the helplessness and confusion about why everything suddenly went to hell in a handbasket was the better plan because that means every now and again I can contact her and pretend to give our about her troubles to get a fresh revenge boner about a newest tale of woe. She thinks I'm the nicest person she's ever met. Edit, a lot of people are under the impression that the things Holly did to me were minor and didn't merit in my reaction, because the ones I spoke about was small. I guess I was trying to make myself a little less pathetic in front of people. She did way more than the specifics I mentioned. It's just embarrassing to admit being weak enough that she could do it all to me. She beat my ass more than a few times once she and her friends force-fed me. Actual no, I don't know what kind. She shoved me down in the bagman and chipped my front tooth on a cinder block. The list goes on and on. And I don't really feel like going into it, but suffice to say, it wasn't just teasing. It doesn't make what I did much better. But I didn't do it over something minor. I am also female also. We lived in a trailer park, which is why they told the house down. Rather than clean it, our house wasn't worth more than three grand on its best day. Those are all the details intended around here, as any others will make things too specific. Now, when I was coming into Nuclear Avengers expecting somebody, but holy, how crazy is that? That's madness. Rent. That that's a person you do what? Uh, Cross helped that grudge for a long time and got some sure... Some bad revenge, man. Wow, imagine being on the end of that. That person is still suffering to this day. Now, what do you think is that way too far? Or is that the right amount of revenge? Would you back that revenge? My God, man.